Well, for all of you out there in media land, uh, thank you for joining in this morning. Uh, we welcome you to Perry Congregational Christian Church. And, uh, it's a time to, to gather and to uh, reflect on what God is speaking to us this morning. My message this morning is simply mercifully dealt with. Have you ever had uh, any serious reflections uh, about how loving parents can take in stride uh, verbal abuse and other teenage acting out uh, from their children? Have you ever wondered... Uh, how on the morning that you may have spoken out harshly and hatefully at, uh, at your wife or your husband, uh, when he or she called your hand on uh, an obvious uh, violation of acceptable behavior. And then the next day, he or she would greet you with a smile and a kiss and uh, aggravatingly sincere, I love you. <laughs> Haven't you wondered how on the evening after uh, you blessed out your father for uh, telling you you can't keep on doing what you're doing? And you just walked away with hard feelings. And then at the end of the day, he said, son, you know that game you've been wanting to go to? I got tickets. Let's go. Or after a, maybe a whole season of adolescent rebellion and all kinds of reasons not to trust uh, anyone, how can parents uh, send a child off to college to face a tough world uh, as an adult uh, with nothing but trust and goodwill. You know, all of that, in a sense, is a mystery. Many of us, I'm sure, uh, have had on occasion some sense of distance between ourselves and God and some sense that at times our lives uh, uh, that we have knowingly and continually violated God's will and openly rebelled in our own way against him. Yeah, two hands were raised. <laughs> Mine and Mel's, both from the coffee shop. <laughs> those memories from those kind of things uh, cause us both sadness on how unnecessary and inappropriate such a way of life was, as well as amazement that God kept on loving us and caring for us anyway. You know, when you think about it, that's pretty staggering. One of the great fathers of the church, St. Augustine, uh, reflected on his life uh, before his relationship with God in his great devotional classic, called Confessions. He described in there eloquently uh, this dimension of God about which we're speaking this morning. You see, before his dramatic conversion, Augustine had uh, been openly a scoundrel uh, with quite an appetite for the sins of the flesh. And But in this book, I'll just read a portion of it where he reflected is there any evil that is not found in my acts? Or if not in my acts, in my words. Or if not in my words, in my will. But you, O oh Lord, are good and merciful, and your right hand has had regard for the depth uh, of my death, and from the very bottom of my heart it has emptied out on the abyss of corruption." I have not forgotten, nor will I keep silent concerning the sharpness of your scourge and the wonderful speed of your mercy. I uttered sighs, and you gave ear to me. 
I wavered back and forth, and you guided me. I wandered uh, upon the, the broad way of the world, but you did not forsake me. That's the key word, I think. You did not forsake me. That could be and should be a, a part of our prayers to God as well. No matter how out of line uh, we were or how far away from God, God did not and will not forsake us. This is also the sentiment of, uh, of the Apostle Paul. Paul once sat down uh, and put down on paper uh, his thoughts about uh, what serving Jesus meant to him. When he said his reflection caused him to take in the whole of his experience with God in Christ from the beginning to the time that he recorded this for Timothy. Paul, like the rest of us, would be honest. If we would be honest anyway. Had to begin with gratitude for God's mercy in sharp contrast with a, with a leaning to be free of God. As he looked back over it all, downs and ups, in all the in-between times as well, what Paul saw most clearly and unmistakably was the mercy of God evidenced in nearly everything this colorful apostle had seen and done before and after his committed life to God through Jesus Christ. And he endured all this in taking a stand for Jesus Christ in a very pagan world. You know, when, when somebody uh, who has been through hard times or in the midst of hard times talks about how good God is, you know what? We need to listen. We really need to listen. That person has my attention. And I feel the same way about, about someone who can own up to the fact that he or she hasn't always done their best for God. The test of God's goodness uh, is not tied to how well things go for us or how successful we are. Though I, I, I don't mean to suggest that we need to, to either be destitute or despicable to understand God's mercy in our lives. The point is, when do you say it? When can we testify to our belief in the goodness of God? Is it only when we're getting our way? Only during the, the periods of uh, obvious success or prosperity? Only when there are no questions to uh, that disturb us? Keep us awake at night? Can we only testify to the goodness of God when our pathways are smooth? If so, what Paul is saying to his uh, protege, Timothy, will not make any sense to us. If there's not some space in our theological selves for a God who is working for our good, especially when times are trying and discouraging. And sometimes we're running our, our hardest to, uh, to get away from God. A hearing of Paul's word is not possible for us. We have to understand when, that when Paul testified, I give thanks to to Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has given me strength for my work. He meant not strength to excel and, and command notice, but strength to endure, just to get by. Just to make it through another day. Paul, as arrogant as he could be, didn't believe he could have made it on his strength alone. Rather, if it were not for divine strength, strength from, from beyond himself, Paul would have run out of anything to offer a long time ago. 
that divine strength came to Paul just because of God's mercy. And Paul knew it. That's why he said, I give thanks to Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has given me strength for my work. Paul talked about uh, some of his greatest sins. Importantly, talked about the people that he had persecuted in the name of God. If people didn't worship God, speak of God in the way that Paul envisioned as proper, he regarded them as godless. The God Paul served and upheld was angry and unforgiving. And the only way of, of responding to people who didn't appease God the way that Paul thought was appropriate was con to condemn them with punishment or even death. Yeah, Paul had on occasion something to do with the death sentence of the people of God. And the killings were all in God's name. Can you be so sure of, of your own conception of God that would you would be willing to put to death or harm another person who found a different way of describing and relating to the very same God? So we can understand the depth of, of Paul's gratitude when he said to Timothy, I thank Jesus Christ for considering me worthy and appointing me to serve him, even though in the past I spoke evil of him and persecuted and insulted him. That might be just a sentence to, to some of us, but it was a profound confession of Paul, which undoubtedly still was, was ripping him apart inside. Paul, I think, had done a lot of thinking about why he, of all people, had been called out to minister to precisely the same people that he had persecuted. Hmm. How could he earn the right to speak to people he had abused and, and, and the survivors of, of those whose deaths he had uh, instigated. Maybe with sins uh, bringing less about dire consequences than those particular sins of Paul. Cool. <laughs> Only in God's house. If that's him, uh, put him on speaker. What right have I to proclaim to you the good news of God in Jesus Christ, whose high standards I have not always kept? And sometimes who I have assuredly hurt through my carelessness, my willfulness. I assure you that that my being here and speaking to you about the most important truths in your lives has much more to do with God than certainly with me. I somehow, somehow take it uh, as an act of maturity to be able to consider the possibility that we might not actually deserve something of value something of uh, uh, pivotal consequence uh, or some great privilege which has come to us by grace alone. In terms of our, uh, of our faith and awareness of God's great expressions of love, we can reflect, we can search, we can ponder, 
and study the matter for a lifetime and never find anything along the way that we did or could have done to earn all that God gives to us. The biblical writers at times just can't seem to, to come to grips with a God who is so loving and forgiving. Especially in, in the Old Testament, we find writers who explain God's grace in the, in the face of, uh, of human sinfulness. And actually, uh, a change of God's mind. The gist is that God, when, when people sin, he has to be angry, he has to be offended, and instantly in the process of planning punishment, when then for some unknown reason that seems to have more to do with luck than love, God changes his mind. That's what happened when, when Moses was atop Mount Sinai. He was in uh, intimate conversation with, with, uh, with God. And uh, right in the middle of something that Moses was saying, God said to Moses, paraphrase, they've had it. They've had it now. It's all over for the Israelites. However, Moses did not want to be the last Israelite on the earth. And he said to God, okay, if you want to wake up, wipe out Jacob and, and you want all that energy you used in getting us out of Egypt to be wasted, go ahead. Go ahead. But God, don't you think you should change your mind on this one? And behold, the Bible says that Moses changed God's mind. It doesn't appear that uh, there was any love involved as far as the writer was concerned. It and even, even appears more evident uh, that Moses was uh, some great persuader, even of God. Well, Paul knew something more than this, uh, though he had been well-schooled in that Old Testament way of thinking about God. Paul certainly wouldn't have claimed to, to understand it all. But the one thing, thing he decided about was how this opportunity to, to minister of the great news of Jesus Christ had come to him. He said, because I acted uh, ignorantly, good word, ignorantly, in unbelief, I was dealt with mercifully. The grace of our God was lavished upon me with the faith and love which are always ours in Christ Jesus. So in Paul's pain, he, he, he penned a great confession of faith, having committed great wrongs in his life, suffered imprisonment and beating for his faith. Paul knew the meaning of God's grace and mercy. And to this young man who would, who would follow in Paul's footsteps as a preacher of the gospel, Paul wrote to Timothy, here are words you may trust, words that merit full acceptance. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, and among them I stand first. But I was mercifully dealt with for this very purpose, that Jesus Christ might find in me the first occasion for displaying all his patience, and that I might be typical of all who were in the future to have faith in him and gain eternal life. Paul wanted to be then and even now an example of what happens when one, even the, the worst of all sinners, falls into the grace of God. 
Paul believed that if God could love him and use him in spite of his overpowering sin, <laughs> it could happen to anybody. Even us. Even us. I like to think about the words uh, in that old hymn. Uh, I, th I think we've sang it here before. Uh, I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. And I wonder, have, have we all considered that very same thing? <clears throat> This is the good news. God's grace reaches down to all of us. You and me and everybody else. We know so, not because of how well things go for us or how saintly we are, how few sins are on our list, but we know in our hearts how mercifully we have been dealt with. Our acts of rebellion have uh, never broken the reality of, of God's stubborn love for us. And I think that's a good word. He has stubborn love. He has to have to accept me. <clears throat> Therefore, you know, our failures cannot keep us uh, either from the, the caring presence of God or from faithful service to those in need of the gospel and the Lord whom it proclaims. We cannot escape our responsibility to witness to God's faithfulness because of our unworthiness. Dear friends, you know, because, because of God's mercy, because of his forgiveness, because it is a reality. It's not fake news. It's a reality. And we go forth in, in, in a spirit of praise to tell others uh, of God who has never, ever forsaken us and who even now strengthens us day by day. Father, thank you for uh, your word this morning to us. God, may it uh, help us. Uh, may it strengthen our, our inner man that we may continue, Lord, uh, in a spirit of, uh, of, uh, of not only of loving you, but of sharing you with others in this sin-steeped world that we live in. Bless us, O oh Father, in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen.